Ryan Clark, who I ran into at uh, the Indie Game Night at Pre-E3 in Los Angeles. Ryan runs a studio called Brace Yourself Games, which uh, I first became familiar with with Crypt of the Necrodancer. That's right. Gave that game a 10 out of 10, I by the way. I appreciated that, thank it, you so It's much. an incredible yeah. game. <laughs> uh, and they've recently launched uh, Cadence of Hyrule, mm -hmm. uh, which is also affiliated with the Crypt of the Nec Necrodancer universe. We're going to get into that a little bit. You also have mm -hmm. a brand new strategy game that you've been working on for a little while yep. called Phantom Brigade, and That's you're right. wearing the t-shirt yeah. of another game. Industries of Titan. Uh, which is what your company could be called now because you just keep making <laughs> tons of, you're like very busy indie developer. We've got a lot of games. We're still pretty small, though. Small teams. How small? Uh, the largest one is six people. Amazing. So our company is like mid mid twenties, but uh, we try to keep the team small because that's what we know how to do. So yeah, you know, we figured out how to make games with small teams. We didn't want to try to scale up because we don't really know how to do that. So instead, we scaled sort of like sideways, <laughs> just have more <laughs> small teams. So. That's smart, though. Yeah. Uh, when I had Brian Provinciano on not too long ago talking mm -hmm. about Shakedown Hawaii, he mentioned you, and he mentioned that one of the things that he really admires about you is that you do a lot of research. Um, into the sort of consuming habits of game players out there. Right. And you have a real kind of understanding of how your titles will sell and, yeah. and how the, the business case. And that isn't always the way that indie games get no. made. Yeah, I think a lot of indie developers just make a game because they really wanted to make that game and see it in the world, which yeah. is super cool. And I respect people that, that do that for sure. But yeah. uh, when you've got you know, 20, 25 people uh, relying on your company for a paycheck, it gets a little more stressful. So you want to be a little bit more certain that what you're doing is actually going to sell. So yeah, actually, I have a stream on, on Twitch on our Brace Yourself Games channel. Every third Friday, I do game industry analysis. So that's what Brian was talking about. So take a look at what's selling on the different platforms. Try to analyze why that's the case. Figure out which genres are on the rise and which ones are on the decline, that sort of thing. And also just figure out you know, what is it about this game that really hooked people? Because I, I think it's really important that you have hooks. You, you can't just, you know, have a game in a hot genre or something like that and hope that that will be enough. Yeah. It has to be in a viable genre, but also um, have hooks that get people excited. Like, why is this game unique? Why should I play this sim game or, or this strategy game instead of some other one? What an incredible service that people can watch this for free, this mm -hmm. this, anal yep. this analyzing of the game industry yep. that you've it's got? it's called the Clark Tank. A and what's like it called? Clark Tank. The it's Clark like the Shark Tank, but oh, the Clark Tank. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. And it's on Brace Your games.com Twi yeah twitch.tv slash brace yourself games okay, but you could you also go. find the link okay. from brace first plug of the show <laughs> right there boom yeah. uh, uh, now uh, take us back into the creation of your company had, had you come from another big studio did you work at EA like a lot of people in Vancouver no or? actually I started out as an indie in 2004 co-founded a company called grubby games okay our first game was professor fizzwizzle it was like a, a side view uh, puzzle game yeah. and it actually got nominated for the grand prize at the IGF and it made enough money even back then that we were able to you know continue making games and even hire some folks so um, ended up making seven games at, at Grubby Games uh, the most probably the most well-known one would be Incredibots which was a side view um, flash robot building game so it was in the browser it was played by hundreds of millions of people wow um, so I still get people these days like coming up to me at GDC saying like I, I got my start making games by like making games in your game Incredibots and, and now I'm in the game industry and That's stuff like fantastic. that so it's pretty cool so yeah we ended up um, selling grubby games for a variety of reasons to to big fish games mm -hmm. uh, and I worked at, as their executive producer running the Vancouver studio for a few years uh, and then after a while, I left there and took a bit of a break for about a year and then came back with Brace Yourself Games and, and Crypt of the Necrodancer. And Crypt was the first game out of the studio? That's right. And like we, you talk about sort of analyzing, you know, customer needs or, you know, the desires of the game player out there. Mm -hmm. How do you identify that Crypt of the Necrodancer, a, <laughs> a rhythm and music based uh, roguelike, yeah. is exactly what gamers need? It's tricky. Well, <laughs> I, I could tell back then. So we started working on it in early 2013. And back then, people were wild about Spelunky and some other roguelike right. games. Yeah. And I loved them, too. So I was trying to think, you know, like, what is it that makes a roguelike game good? Like, why why does Spelunky stand out compared to other roguelikes? And I felt like one of the reasons why it was more accessible than other games like the original Rogue, which I played a ton of, and NetHack and stuff like that, yeah. is because it's more skill-based. Um, so, like, your real-time actions um, actually make a difference. So it feels more fair, because in the original Rogue, you could just run out of food and die. Yeah. And it felt like, ah, oh, how could I even have... It was a total roll of the dice. Exactly. Right? It yeah. felt pretty frustrating, even though I loved that game. So I was like, wow, this Spelunky managed to solve this. So I was trying to figure out, you know, how could I make a skill-based roguelike game, but make it feel more close to actual rogue? Yeah. Because I do love that too. And so my idea was to make you 
actually have to take your turns because I still like the turn-based nature of it, but do it quickly because then you have to think fast, right? So it was never a rhythm game to begin with. It was just like fast rogue. Yeah. But then I realized if you have to move every half second or second, that felt kind of like moving to the beat of something. And so I actually like prototyped it using Michael Jackson's Thriller as the, the music because it's, you know, the zombies and stuff like that. It's perfect for a dungeon crawling game. And it just felt really good. So yeah, the rest of it sort of snowballed from there. So yeah, I was trying to like solve a problem that I saw with roguelike games. So I knew that roguelike games were a viable genre at the time yeah. on Steam. And yeah, we had a new new hook based on, you know, this solution that I had to a problem with roguelike games. That's awesome. So when you're, a, you know, a, a, an indie developer and you're just sort of carving your own path uh, using the analytics and, and mm -hmm. the, the, the way that you analyze stuff, how do you go about finding employees that are appropriate for the tasks that, that you're sort of setting out for yourself that think along those lines? Because I would imagine a lot of people that want to work at indie developers also want to be a little more organic with the way yep. that they produce this stuff. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's another reason why we've managed to succeed is because uh, what I try to do is just, first of all, help people as much as possible. So that's why we do the Twitch stream and things like that is because I had a lot of people help me yeah. and I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for all the help that I got. So, so right. paying it forward helps, but paying it forward also helps people to know you. And yes. so like, if you're deciding what indie developer might I like to work with, like, well, there's that Ryan Clark guy who told me this bit of information that, that uh, was very valuable to me. Um, that helps, but also we travel to a lot of conventions and meet folks. Um, there's a lot of other volunteer things that, that I and other people at Brace Yourself Games um, do just to try and be a part of the industry. And so the more people you know, the more likely it is that when you have an opening, one of them would be like, yeah, Ryan's fun. Like I enjoy hanging out with him or whatever. It would be cool to make a game together with him. Or if not them, they might know someone who, who would, right? So That's having awesome. that broader network helps. And it sort of, it snowballs too. Like the more people you know, and the more well-known your games become, yeah. the easier and easier it is to, to find new people that might like working with you, so. So when you were at Big Fish, were you working on mobile type titles and, and sort of tracking real-time analytics and developing to data that was coming in? Yeah, we, we were actually, uh, we joined sort of right at the beginning of the social game boom. Yeah. So we were making a social game for, right. um, for Facebook. And then we were also making just like casual games. So my previous seven games, they were indie-ish, uh, but also we knew that back then, one of the best ways to sell your games was on portals like Big Fish. Sure. And so we tried to make them like somewhat portal friendly as well. Um, so yeah, they, they bought us because, you know, we were making, we were producing games that were selling well on their platforms. So yeah, we did some of that, but yeah, the, the main one we were working on was like a island simulation game for, for Facebook which got shut down after after a little while. But okay. learned, learned a lot about, about games doing that. Like we had never done something that, that many users simultaneously before. Yeah, and I, it feels like you, you adapted that sort of analytic kind of development that's rampant in our business right now, not mm -hmm. always to, you know, I think the, the best use case or the best sort of art being yeah. generated out there, but you've turned it into a, an art making endeavor, right? Yeah. You've been able to fuse a couple of these things together. Yeah, I realize that I kind of prefer Instead of making games where you're, you're, you're changing each feature or whatever to monetize better, that doesn't feel like, I don't know, as, as pure to me. Instead, we do the analysis up front to try right. to figure out what's a genre what's gonna that will work. Yeah. Uh, and then we just try our hardest to give them the most fun. So rather than you know, try to figure out like, how do we do this to monetize them the best, yeah. we monetize them with you know, the idea that, that hooks them, right? And then we try to deliver as best we can on that so yeah. that hopefully they'll be long-term fans because they'll be like, yeah, it was a great hook I was interested in, but also they delivered good value to me. I like them and I'm going to keep, you know, buying their games. That sounds like the philosophy of another video game company. Oh, yes, I know. Nintendo. <laughs> Seems like they do a little bit of that as well. Yep. And uh, so you had the opportunity to fuse Crypto the Necrodancer with The Legend of Zelda, mm -hmm. which is an amazing bravo to that, by the way, because <laughs> we don't really hear about Nintendo working with indie developers all that often. Never, actually. <laughs> which, which all is, that never. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty impressive. Um, and congratulations on the launch of this game. Thank you. How, how is it doing? How is it being received? How are you, are you hearing good, you know? Yeah, most of the feedback that we've received is, is really positive. It looks like the Metacritic is around 86, which is pretty much what Necrodancers was as well. Um, and yeah, we're getting great press quotes from people like Polygon saying it's the best Zelda spinoff of all time, that sort of stuff. So it's yeah. pretty, pretty gratifying to see because certainly a lot of people were paying attention and were watching, especially in, in the indie sphere, like watching what we were doing. So yeah, a lot of eyeballs on us, but it's nice to, to finally have it out there and see that people really do 
like it. Is it completely surreal for you to be in a Nintendo Direct and to be just, yep. you know, butted up against all of these juggernauts and there's your game? Yep. Still yeah. don't totally believe it, but uh, <laughs> oh yeah, it's a pretty cool experience. And yeah, that, that first Nintendo Direct where we announced it, um, it's funny, obviously we got a lot of buzz and, and press and stuff like that um, from the announcement, but also my, my sister, she, um, she makes like pies on the internet, like super cool themed pies of various kinds of characters. Wow. And she, she made a Bowser pie. Yeah. Uh, either that day or the day after or something like that and her Bowser pie got like more reddit upvotes than than our announcement what? did and what? I was like like oh. darn you sister like I finally <laughs> do you know the biggest thing I've ever done in my career and she's like Bowser pie and just <laughs> kicks my butt and, and Doug Bowser himself commented on it and oh, stuff no like that oh no way really yeah. oh my yeah. god yeah. I see a few, like, if you're doing the analysis on that, I've mm-hmm. used the pie and game making. Mm-hmm. Nobody's doing that. <laughs> Ship games and pies it's at the true, same time. It's true. There, I'll there talk to go. my sister, yeah. Be very busy pie making. Um, okay, so uh, this game has come out, and they launched mm-hmm. it at E3, mm-hmm. which was that nerve-wracking for you guys to have it all ready and it's it's out that week, or was it ready for a while before it was ready to go? Uh, it always takes a little while to go through logic and, and things like that, right? Yeah. So, um it was still nerve wracking to to have it happen, especially while we were away. A few of us were at sure. E3 rather yeah. than at You have at a home. team of six people. Then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, it was a little strange not being at home with everyone to be able to celebrate when it when it launched. But um, yeah, it was just great to see the reviews were so good. So everyone was, was relieved and, and felt awesome once it came out. Zelda and Crypt of the Necrodancer. Mm-hmm. A lot more people know about Zelda. <laughs> And, really? And, and, yeah, and so, but so this must be a, a lot of people's first sort of kick mm-hmm. at this kind of a game. For sure. Are you doing a lot of, uh, you know, help desk type things? People mm. tweeting you and wanting strategy guide type Ye- assistance on this thing. Yeah, although we did include in the game um, a thing called fixed beat mode. So like if we see that you're missing a lot of beats, it automatically suggests to you like, hey, maybe you want to play the game without the rhythm mechanic and you just move whenever you want because we knew that some people would probably struggle with so it. So a little more traditional Zelda-ish. Yeah, it yeah. turns it into like almost like a tactics game because you can just move one turn and then wait and, and see like, okay, if I move to the right, I'm going to get hit, so I should move up or back or whatever. Oh, wow. So okay. um, I think that helps a lot of folks. But yeah, we definitely are getting a lot of tweets and, and things as well saying like, I I can't find the last heart container. Where do I where do I find it? And I think a lot of people may not realize that the overworld is procedural. Like it changes every time yes. you play it. So I can't actually tell you like, oh, it's in the top left corner. You didn't find that one because like it's different every time. Yeah. So. One thing that I uh, and I talked about this a little bit in my review is the uh, you have to explore before mm-hmm. you go into the dungeons. You, you could go into the dungeon. You just get your butt you gotta kicked. You got to be really good. Yeah, yes, yes. Because you get totally swarmed. So I, I would love, because I know that a lot of people that are going to be looking for Cadence of Hyrule videos and stuff, they're mm-hmm. going to watch this video. I'd love for you to just give people a couple of tips on how to play the game mm. from your perspective. Okay, well, I think the number one thing that people don't realize is that you can beat the game without ever getting hit at all. Yeah. So, like, uh, every enemy has a predictable pattern. So, if you just learn their pattern, just watch them for a while before you engage them and see, like, okay, it moves on every second beat or every third beat or it moves diagonally every second beat or something like that. And once you learn how they move, then even if you have just the base weapon, you can still kill them without ever getting hit. So, yeah, I think um, that would be the number one tip is make sure you know their, their patterns uh, and you know, don't just rush in there uh, fighting a bunch of enemies all at once. Take your time, try and fight them one on one if you can. Uh, and there are people like uh, who speed run the game constantly. Like you talked about going into a dungeon and just dying. Well, there are people who can who can do it. You know, they don't even bother picking up the heart containers and stuff like that. So wow. you can watch them online speed running it. You'll learn a lot from from watching them. So um, people like Spooty Biscuit, he's probably the the best Necro Dancer and Cadence of Hyrule speedrunner. He's got most of the, the the world records right now. So yeah, check out Spooty Biscuit on Twitch to learn from him. Do you like people speed running through your games, or d- does it drive you guys crazy? Yeah, well, we definitely designed. It knowing that people were going to speedrun it because Crypto the Necrodancer, when we early accessed it on Steam, we saw that you know, we, we had a speedrun timer in it and we hoped that people would speedrun it and we were already speedrunning it when we tested. Yeah. But yeah, it, it just totally blew up and now there's like a, a whole racing league that's formed around it. Oh, wow. uh, and so we knew that, you know, the fans of Necrodancer who play Kids of Hyrule are going to want to race it as well. So we were, you know, making sure that it was viable as a, a racing game from the, from the beginning. That's awesome. The music in both Crypt and in Cadence is fantastic. Was mm-hmm. it the same process? Do you, do you get the, the music in and then you design to that or 
uh, to take us into that a little bit. Like yes, how do you do both that? both soundtracks were made by Danny Baranowski, so he's the same composer of Super Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac, yeah, um, Cannibal and lots of other amazing games. Um, yeah, usually we give him the requirements to like. The tempo is a really important thing, obviously, in yeah. a rhythm game. Like, if it's too fast, it's going to be extremely hard. So in Necrodancer, we would say, okay, so for the first level of zone one, the tempo should be like 120. And then the next one, it needs to be 135 and then 140. Um, so slowly ramping up. And then for certain bosses, we would tell them, you know, it should be faster or slower. Or in some of them, we have one called King Konga, where every eighth beat is a rest. So you don't move on the eighth beat. Yeah. So that had to be a quite a different composition. So we basically give him those constraints and then let him figure it out because he's an extremely talented guy and he just comes back with amazing stuff that always impresses us so like in Necrodancer each zone has a kind of uh, different feel to it and yep. it was different like uh, musical uh, influences that that uh, he drew upon for each zone um, so yeah a lot of it is is from him also the singing shopkeeper which is in both games I love it uh, it was his idea it just came when when I was hanging at at his house back when he lived in Seattle and yeah he just like made this crazy you know, thing, and we tried putting it in the game, and it was hilarious. It was just so funny. So, yeah, a lot of the good ideas in the game come from from Danny for sure. That must just be his creativity. Yeah, I guess right. When you're small and and nimble like yeah. that, you're going to be adapting all the time to great ideas. Yeah. Is it a is it a day of celebration when he drops a track into the game, and you guys have been play testing, and then all of a sudden you've got all the music to to play the game to? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's inspirational to to see it. So, like, we've been playing. You know, at the beginning, like I said originally, it was. Uh, um, Michael Jackson's Thriller, but once I got Danny's actual music in there, like, oh, this actually feels amazing. It feels like a real game. Yeah. And yeah, once we had the first, you know, Zelda track into Cadence of Hyrule, it starts to feel a lot more like a Zelda game, right? So, that is awesome. so yeah, it's uh, a big boost whenever we get a new a new track from Danny. You've kind of carved out this really awesome niche for yourself. I mean, it's a roguelike, but there isn't really another thing that you can point to that's quite like this game. Mm -hmm. Is this now inspiring you to, you know, iterate and to, you know, maybe even deviate a little bit and try... Uh, you know, music rhythm based platformer or something like that. It's possible. There are some music rhythm based platformers, uh, and there there actually was one other uh, game for the Ouya called Soul, Soul Fjord, which was like a dungeon crawling oh, yeah, rhythm I do game as well. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, it was not grid based, and the combat was, was quite a bit different, so it had a different feel. Uh, but yeah, I do think that, uh, you know, I, I talked about how I analyze different uh, genres and s talk about which ones are viable, and I do think that rhythm games are a viable genre. Yep. There are you know new rhythm games and music games that come out and you know do are massive successes. Like Beat Saber is like the best uh, VR game and makes tons of money, right? So yeah. you know if there are developers out there who are considering what genre to make, you know rhythm games is is viable. So um, I expect we we might prototype more more things at some point in the future. Uh, but yeah, we also have other games that are non-rhythm games that, that we're working on too. So it's part of the reason why we're indies is because we just get to make whatever the heck we want. Yeah. And if we feel like making more rhythm games, then maybe we'll do that in the future. But okay, very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about Phantom Brigade. Now, this mm. is a game that you guys have been uh, working on for a while. It's a strategy game with yep. giant robots. You got my attention. Love that kind of <laughs> stuff. It looked in in incredible when I saw it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but the game's been gestating for a while. Mm -hmm. How long have you been cooking on this one? Uh, so actually, this the game was originally created by a company called Tetragon Works in Seattle, and they we acquired them. They merged with us, oh, and they wow. moved up to Vancouver. So wow. that's part of what we're talking about with just meeting lots of other developers and you know having a good reputation in the indie space. You know, people might want to work with you on their games. So you're the big fish now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we we were uh, you know friends of friends with them and you know people that we knew vouched for them and I saw the game and saw you know the potential in it um, and there were things that they you know could use help with like uh, you know learning how to promote the game and make trailers for it and things like that was not something that they really enjoyed or you know was their strong suit sure uh, you know and some design feedback and things like that but they also were a team of super talented technical artists and we were starting to make this game Industries of Titan which is our first 3D game yep. and we're like man we could use some help on this front as well so you know people always talk about synergy is like a bad buzzword or whatever but there actually was good let's synergy bring it back. there yes let's bring it back yeah if you use it correctly there's <laughs> nothing wrong with it so so yeah the, uh, but at the time, the game was more like a traditional XCOM-ish game, but with giant mechs. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I didn't think that that was, you know, as, as hooky as the game, you know, could be and that we could do better than that. Uh, so the team um, went back to the drawing board and basically prototyped more 
innovative combat, yep. a, a variety of ones, and we found one that worked really well that they produced, and now they spent the last year like gutting the game and putting the new combat system in there. So, so now the, the goal with the game was always to make something a lot more cinematic, so it felt more like a mecha anime. Yeah. And so now the game is real-time but turn-based, so you, you have five seconds of real-time that you plan out, and then you hit execute and you see it all unfold. Uh, but you can also see what the enemy is going to do in advance. So you can plan to counteract what they're doing. So it feels a lot more like a mecha anime now because in, in those, there's always like a ton of enemies, but uh, the Gundam is, is so strong that it can take all of them out, right? So yeah. in ours, since you know what they're going to do, you can take out you know six, seven tanks with one mech just because you can predict what they're going to do. Yeah. And then it's more cinematic because it plays out in real time um, with, with physics and, and, and all of that. So yeah, mechs can trip and collide and smash into buildings and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's much closer to the vision and also much, much hookier now. Awesome. And, and when you're analyzing the viability of giant robots, <laughs> they're always viable, right? <laughs> I agree. In, Into the Breach came out, and that's mm -hmm. another great giant robot. It's tiny. It's, but, uh, so this feels like the next level of that kind of idea. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I think um, there's, there's so many fans of, obviously, mecha anime and of uh, uh, strategy games, and yeah, Into the Breach is, is proof, and Into the Breach also has like a look forward sort of uh, ability. Yep. Um, but yeah, ours is a bit less predictable than Into the Breach. Into the Breach, you know that that's what's going to happen, yep. but in Phantom Brigade, uh, it's all physics based, so if you, if you know the enemy intends to move from here to there, but you shoot out the enemy mech's legs, they're going to fall uh, uh, you know, halfway through it. And then you might be running across where they fell, and you didn't know they were going to fall at that point. Yeah. And so you might trip over them or something like that and crash into a building. So uh, unexpected funny things can, can occur. So different from Into the Breach in that, in that yeah, way. It looks amazing. When, when is the game going to... Are you early accessing the uh, game still, or is it's it...? It's going to be the first half of 2020 is when we will early access it. You're going to early access it next year. Yeah. Okay, cool. And is it PC-centric, or are you going to bring it to the consoles? PC too? for now, yeah. The uh, the game is like very UI heavy. It's got a you know a timeline that you you know place your orders on and scrub through time and things oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. So in order to bring that to console, it's going to require, you know, to do a good job of it, it's yeah. going to require some time um, refining the UI. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're going to bring it to PC, and if it does as well as we hope, then it would make sense for us to, to also bring it to consoles. Awesome. You have Industries of Titan That's as right. well. And when is it? it is this one far along, or are you just beginning? This one we're hoping to early access later this year. Okay, great. Yeah, so this will be our, our next launch, if all goes according to plan. And what kind of a game is it? I, I'm not familiar with this one. It is uh, an industrial city building sim strategy game. Oh. So it's a, it's a bunch of words that I just threw at you, but, <laughs> but it's like a... Uh, a city builder, but if it were set on Saturn's moon Titan, you know, in a, a sci-fi sort of future. Very cool. So yeah, you get to do the same sorts of things that you would do in city builders, you know, plan your, you know, decide how you want your city to grow, yep. but there's a lot of things that come from that sci-fi setting that you don't get in a typical city builder, so you can decide, you know, do you want to focus on, on combat and building ships and going and attacking your enemies and things like that, or focus more on the political aspect or technological or uh, industrial because you have factories where you actually place devices inside the factories That's as awesome. Well, so. That's awesome. Is this born out of a love for previous SimCity type of experiences? Yeah, yeah. I love that franchise. Yeah, too. big, big Sim strategy, uh, SimCity fans uh, for sure. Also, the the artist who does all the, the voxel art, his name is Sir Karma. Yeah. Um, he just produces beautiful cityscapes and things like that. If you follow him on Twitter, his feed is just full of, of beautiful stuff. So, inspired by you know people like him and also um, uh, you know Blade Runner and 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 those sorts of things. It's just like beautiful cities. It would be nice to be able to like make one and, and live in that sort of thing. So Absolutely. Yeah. Is this one going to be PC only for a while at least? Yeah, similar. Yeah. Um, because it's a sim game, you can imagine there's lots of menus and clicking yeah. and, and things like that. So games like that require more efforts to to port. Have so. you checked out Pocket City on the uh, on on the uh, phones? No, I've not. There's an iOS game out there, an actually <laughs> very impressive little Sim City variant huh. made by a very small team out of Toronto. Right. And it, it blew my mind. It huh. actually worked quite well on the. Okay, so I'll have to check out how they did the UI. Yeah. Yeah, you might. Uh, it might actually be something that you could bring over to mobile. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, we're hoping so. Like the gameplay should work on on mobile. Um, but yeah, again, requires some UI overhaul. So hopefully we'll get there. That's great. Okay, so we've got Industries of Titan to look forward to, mm -hmm. and we've got Phantom Brigade to look forward to, and you can pick up uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer and uh, Cadence, of, Cadence Hyrule. of Hyrule right now. Ryan, thank you so much thank for you, coming Victor. in. Thank you, Victor.